worldwide interactive event. We are here tonight breaking new ground. Nothing like this has ever been attempted before. Right now, you all are online with me from every corner on our planet, places like Albania, Bolivia, Cambodia, Ecuador, Finland, Hong Kong, China, India, Zimbabwe, Australia, Canada, the UK, and the rest of Europe, along with, of course, all 50 states here in our United States of America. Over 139 countries are represented in our class tonight. Welcome to you all. So I want to get started. This is the most exciting thing I've ever done. I've done a lot of things in my life, but I am most proud of the fact that all of you have joined us in this global community to talk about what I believe is one of the most important subjects and presented by one of the most important books of our time, A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose. I don't think there's anything more important than awakening and also knowing what your purpose is. And for the next 10 weeks, author and spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle and I will be here in our virtual classroom here on Oprah.com every Monday, 8 p.m., be on time for class, 8 p.m. Central. We're going to be answering your emails. We're going to be having a conversation about each chapter and taking your calls uh, from around the world and your emails from around the world and seeing some of you around the world uh, through our Skype phones. I'm sure you've already noticed that you can type in your questions on the right side of your screen and send that to us instantly. And uh, we will, you know, we have a whole team of people here who are uh, ready, but waiting, standing by uh, to take your calls and emails. And of course, I'm honored to introduce uh, the author of this uh, great book, A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose, Eckhart Tolle. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. How exciting is it? Yeah. yeah. It's very good. Okay, so let's get class started. The way we're going to work the class is that we will have a conversation and uh, take your, your calls and your questions um, whenever we feel appropriate. Uh, first of all, I wanted to just talk to you about how this book came to you. I was introduced to this book uh, several uh, months ago when I was interviewing Eckhart Tolle on XM Radio. I have a show on XM Radio. Uh, not people know, many people know about it, but it's called The Soul Series. And on that show, I get to talk to anybody I choose, and I choose to speak to people who represent this kind of thinking, this genre of spirituality. And we talk about uh, the soul. So I was interviewing Eckhart Tolle several months ago about his book, The Power of Now, because that's really all I knew about Eckhart Tolle was The Power of Now. I call you the father of now, <laughs> The Power of Now, uh, which that book was a life-changing book for me, given to me many years ago, about eight years ago, by um, Meg Ryan, who's on the show. And the producer, Corny, came in and said, well, as I was preparing, she said, there's this other book he's written called A New Earth. And I just had time to thumb through A New Earth and not really give it its due because I was focused on reading The Power of Now and talking to you about that. And after our interview, started to read this book and it was absolutely, I felt the shift that you talk about. That you say on page seven that this will be meaningless to you or you will feel the shift. I started to feel the shift. And one of the things that, that really occurred to me as I was going through various chapters and having aha, aha, aha moment after another is what a clear, how clear this message is. Um, what a clear channel it seemed to come through for you. Mm. It was like I'd never, you know, didn't know you or, or hadn't met you in person even through the radio. We weren't sitting in the mm. same studio. How did this come to be? How did this come through you, to you? Well, it comes out of uh, the space of stillness, that's where all creative endeavor is born. So it's getting in touch with the stillness within, mm -hmm. where there's no mental noise. Mm -hmm. And out of that stillness, 
uh, when the time is right, sometimes an impulse comes, something, a feeling, a strong sense that something wants to be born into this world. Mm -hmm. I had the same strong sense before writing The Power of Now. Uh, that was um, 13 years ago when I started writing it. I had left England, I was living in England, and I had this strong impulse one morning, and I was in England still, knowing I have to move to the west coast of North America without knowing why. I, this is just a feeling you had. Uh, yes, a strong knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not through a decision-making process, mm -hmm. just the realization I have to move there. I don't know why, but I have to go. It was such a total, no, absolutely no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Vancouver, to, and then I took a Greyhound bus to California, knew only one or two people, and I said, why am I here? Three weeks passed, somebody put me up in a room in, near San Francisco, and suddenly uh, this came, I bought a notepad, and suddenly the strong stream came through, and I wrote, what is enlightenment? The beginning of the power of now. The moment I wrote that, I knew this is the book that wants to be born. Mm -hmm. So rather than me wanting to write a book, it was, there was a book that wanted to be written. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I, Michelangelo says, the angel's in the marble, and he just cuts away the marble. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I find, I'll come back to that in a second. For most people, that is the, the approach to what, what, what is my purpose, to look at what the greater purpose is, what does the greater purpose want from me, what does life or yeah. God want what from me, you? rather than what do I want from life. So that's the starting point. I know that sometimes uh, in New Age you have the question, well, what do you want? But it's fine to ask that question, but a more powerful question is, what does life want from me? How do I fit into the, what is the totality? What is my place within the, to the whole? So this is how it started, as knowing that this is what life wants from me. The book wants to be born, and the same thing happened later with the uh, new Earth, again, a similar sense of, oh, there's another book that wants to come. I didn't know why, because everybody told me, well, you've said it all in the power of now, why write another book? And I, intellectually, I couldn't have answered, why am I writing another mm -hmm. book? Mm -hmm. And it happened. And it happened. Were you asking life, um, universal energy? I don't know. What do you, you call that? Is a word? Do you, I call it God. What, do you, what word do you uh, use for that? Consciousness. Were you asking universal. consciousness? Were you saying, "What do you want from me?" Yes, I. The there was a time for quite a few years. I lived in England, and I just did some spiritual teaching on a very small scale. Mm -hmm. Sometimes little workshops and mm -hmm. so on. I read and in I, the paper today in the USA Today where you said you started out with ten or twelve people in in people's homes. Yes, for quite a while I would teach in people's living rooms. I invited a group of friends, and, and this is, was the beginning of informal spiritual teaching. Mm -hmm. And as I said uh, to the person who interviewed me, this is coming full circle now because now I'm back in people's living rooms. <laughs> just more of them. Just than, more of uh, them. I think we have more than ten or twelve <laughs> joining us this evening. <clears throat> and so the book. Would you sit and, uh, you know, passages would come to you? Would you, you know, actively get up at a certain time and, and say, I'm going to write today or know what you were going to write before it was written? No, not knowing it beforehand, but uh, every day there was the space for writing. Every morning you know, and until two in the afternoon or so, the space was set aside for writing. That was the writing space. Mm -hmm. And there were days when the, the flow was uh, not very strong, so maybe only a few lines got written or even none at all. Nevertheless, I always honored that space of I'm ready for the writing to happen. I'm not saying that the writing happened automatically. My mind was involved. It mm -hmm. wasn't a channeled book as such. Mm -hmm. It was inspired but not channeled, so it involved my thinking processes too. But the thinking process had to be inspired from something deeper. You can't rely on your thinking processes only to and produce something that is powerful and original. So already you've shared with us that in order to awaken to your life's purpose, one of the key things we must do is not try to tell life what our purpose is, not go around even, um, uh, I don't know, trying to define for ourselves, because a lot of people say many times, I've done 
you know, seminars across the country, and they'll say, I don't know what my purpose is. You're saying you must ask life, what purpose does it have for you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the answer may not immediately come. Mm -hmm. The very important part of asking life so that you can be ready to receive the answer is to practice uh, inviting moments of stillness into your life mm -hmm. so that you are not continuously absorbed in the incessant mental noise that we call thinking, most of which is unnecessary and repetitive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to, to find spaces of stillness is vital if you want to get to the place where the answers are, potentially. Mm -hmm. So for quite a few years when I lived in England, and did spiritual teaching on a small scale, uh, sometimes I would say, okay, I, they could do much more. There would be, there's much more that I could do, I said to life. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. and, but life just waited and waited. And the answer didn't come for several years until that morning when it said, move. Move. <laughs> move. Yeah. Move to... to to, to Vancouver. Yes, and why did I have to move to write it there? I didn't realize that. The, every place, Vancouver and California, that's where the Power of Now was written. I was mm -hmm. moving back and forth. I didn't have a home as such. I stayed with friends, mm -hmm. moving back and forth. And so only later I realized I had to move because the energy field on the West Coast, this is what I needed for the book to be born. Mm. The energy field in England, although I love England, I have a deep inner connection with England, the energy felt there was not right for, in my personal case, for this book to come out. Wow. Uh, so I only realized that after I had to go back to England and then I stayed in, in a community uh, because I didn't have a home of my own anymore and I wanted to continue writing but I couldn't do very much there because I thought, why can't I continue? The stream stopped. I could only do editing and correction that was necessary too. Mm -hmm. But only when I went back to the West Coast, my visa had expired, I had to go to England, and I went back, immediately the flow came back. Mm. And I said, oh, now I know why I had to move. So it's often trusting life when a very strong impulse comes. Mm -hmm. But you may have to wait. It doesn't mean that you necessarily immediately obey every impulse because Impulses can also come from more superficial levels mm -hmm. within yourself. And but you were wise enough to do, know the difference. You had discernment. Yes. Yes, to know yes. the difference. Yes. Well, it's so interesting because you, in the beginning of A New Earth, start out talking about a flower. And I've heard many people who, because I go on the message boards every day. I'm loving you on the message boards, everybody. <laughs> and many people are saying that they look at flowers differently now. I can certainly say that... I do. And one of the things that you said that struck me when you said that they, they are representatives of the spiritual realm and that when you are still, allow yourself to be still with a flower or a crystal yes. or a bird or really anything of nature, Yes. but you used a flower specifically yes. because... Because a flower is... Every, nature on the whole is a beautiful access point into inner stillness if you can be there present mm -hmm. but a flower is even everything Say messengers is, from another realm yes like messengers a flower is very uh, much more fragile than a plant it is more fleeting mm -hmm. uh, ethereal I think is the word yes. more ethereal so it's it has less density to it than most other things it is so, it's, and because of the lack of density it's almost as if spirit could flow through it more freely. Mm -hmm. So when you contemplate a flower without too much interference of the thinking mind mm -hmm. to actually truly look, this is what Jesus said, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, in churches you hear Jesus saying, look at the lilies of the field. Yes. And so when he said that, he wasn't just saying, look at the lilies of the field. He said, Aren't they look. Pretty? Yes. He said, look, you really have to look because there is, there is something that they embody something that you also have, but, but because of all your anxiety about tomorrow and your thinking, that's what he's, I'm translating very freely now, yes. what Jesus said. Why are you, these flowers are not anxious, they, have no, they are not concerned about tomorrow, and see how beautiful they are, mm -hmm. how God clothes them in, in such beauty. And you can live 
like that also. So he, want, he used this natural realm and flowers to get people in touch with the dimension of depth within them. Well, what's very interesting to me about all of this is that when I read that the first time, I thought it was, you know, a beautiful passage. And then I read it a second time and um, awakened a little bit more and started to look at nature differently. You know, I have a, you know, live in a lovely space where I'm surrounded by flowers, not in Chicago, <laughs> but, but uh, in California. And, you know, I always just appreciated the garden. Aren't they lovely and all the different colors and the roses and all that? And then I decided to move into the garden without naming it. What if I were like a babe? Yes. What if I were a babe, yes. you know, learning what a flower was for the first time? What if I uh, went out under the, the oaks that I love so much, but I didn't know it was an oak? I didn't know what to call it. And I shared this uh, in one of our after shows that for the first time, and I've loved trees all of my life and the, the, the sense of power and stillness they represent, but by not naming those things in nature, that I felt a magical presence. I felt a, a sense of majesty and power and strength and connection that I'd never felt before. Yes. Because I didn't give it a name. Yes, that's the key. Yes. I didn't give a name or have a reference for everything that a tree has meant in my life. That's right. Isn't it? That's right. So being present mm -hmm. with the perception. And this, this theme runs, is perhaps the main theme running through the whole book, is that, that state where the compulsive naming of things, yes. and you start with nature because that's easier to let go of the naming. Mm -hmm. Later, we'll be talking about that in some future yeah. session. Stop labeling people. Y yes, and that's more difficult because but, yeah. people invite the labels yes. Yes. because there's so much mind in everybody and they label you and you label them. So, but with nature, this is the starting point to find a different relationship to nature. Uh, it doesn't mean that you need to forget what you have learned about trees or about flowers. When mm -hmm. it's necessary, you can get that knowledge and you use it. Right. But to ha not to be totally in the grip of what you have learned of mental labels, of interpreting mentally, but being able to perceive, mm -hmm. one could call it, perceive the flower, see it through a background of just stillness. Just stillness. Which is really consciousness. Yes. Well, I will tell you, it's an amazing, for the, all of those of you who've tried this, and I know some of you have because you've uh, emailed us and said so, but when you start to walk through a park and, or walk in your backyard or begin to, exp and you're right, it's easier with nature than with yeah. people, and pretend that you don't know or just let yourself be in the space without labeling the things, it's just, everything's vibrating and it's like you know, scintillating. Yes. And everything's exciting. Yes. And that's, everything's uh, exciting. Yes. And a then walk you, through the park right. becomes exciting and it's the same path you've always taken. Yes. And before, when you were involved in, in your mind, yes. perhaps you didn't even see it. But never saw it. I see. Right. Yeah. And, and so many people are so trapped in this continuous mental noise that absorbs their whole attention all the time. Every thought absorbs the stream of thinking, absorbs mm -hmm. their attention. They don't see that the world around them is vitally alive. Yeah. So you become gradually, as you, people then grow older, the the world around them becomes more and more lifeless and dead. Right. Right. And and that happens to them also. And why is that? Because that is because you are run by mental abstraction. The, all the concepts and the thoughts in that are abstractions. It's not life. So you can't take in. The information that's that's there to be received all around you because you're so distra you're in your head you're in your head you're, you're your not head. you're not present all right so you're lost in thought I could say that's the human condition is being lost in thought hmm. uh, and people don't and that of course is the famous what we call the voice in the head the voice in the head some people have been asking about which we'll be talking a lot about the voice uh, in the so head some people say what what voice in the head it's that one. It's that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Kelly from Alton, Illinois, joins us via Skype. Kelly, hi. Hi, Sarah. Hi, hi what's your Carter. question? Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, good. Where are you, home? 
I'm at home. Okay, good. This is the coolest thing. Isn't this cool? It is crazy. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. I, that's what I think. It's crazy that we're like out here, wherever this is, talking to each other. Okay, what's your question? Well, my question is regarding religion and spirituality. Big one. I had a Catholic upbringing. I married a Catholic, and we're raising our children this way. In reading books such as Tolly's, I've really op it's really opened my eyes up to a new way of thinking, a new form of spirituality that doesn't always align with the teachings of Christian Christianity. So my question is to you, Oprah, how have you reconciled these spiritual teachings with your Christian beliefs? Oh, the question's to me. I was, I was resting knowing it was going to be about <laughs> him. Uh, I've reconciled it because I was able to open my mind about the, um, the absolute indescribable hugeness of that which we call God. Um, I took God out of the box because I grew up in the Baptist church and there were, you know, rules and, you know, belief sy systems and doctrine. And um, I happened to be um, sitting in church in my late 20s and I was going to this church where you had to get there at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning or you couldn't get a seat and a very uh, charismatic minister and everybody was just, you know, into the sermon. And uh, this great uh, minister was preaching about how great God was and how omniscient and omnipresent and God is everything. And then he said, and the Lord thy God is a jealous God. And I was, you know, caught up in the rapture of that moment until he said jealous. <laughs> and something struck me. Just, and I was like, uh, I think about 27 or 28. I was thinking, God is all, God is omnipresent, God is all. And God's also jealous, jealous, God is jealous of me. Um, and something about that didn't, didn't feel right in my spirit because I believe that God is love and that God is in all things. And so that's when the, the, the search for something more than doctrine uh, started to stir within me. And I love this quote that uh, Eckhart has uh, this is one of my favorite quotes in uh, chapter one, where he says, man made God in his own image. The eternal, the infinite, and unnameable was reduced to a mental idol that you had to believe in and worship as my God or our God. Now, I think that's very eloquently put uh, by Eckhart Tolle in chapter one, but that is exactly what I was feeling when I was, um, you know, you know, sitting in church that, that, that Sunday listening to the preacher. And, right. you know, it's, it's been a journey to get to the place where I understand, as I said on the pre-show here, that what I believe is that Jesus came to show us Christ consciousness, that Jesus came us to show us the way of the heart and that what Jesus was saying that to show us the higher consciousness that we're all talking about here. Jesus came to say, look, I'm going to live in the body, in the human body, and I'm going to show you how it's done. These are some, some principles and some laws that you can use to live by to, to know that way. And when I, when I started to recognize that, that Jesus didn't come, in my belief, even as a Christian, I don't believe that Jesus came to start Christianity. So... That was also very helpful to me. And as I said earlier in the pre-show here, there was a wonderful book called Discover the Power Within You by Eric Butterworth, uh, which helped me reconcile the two. So that might be really good for those of you who are Christian and trying to, to balance the two. Mm -hmm. What would you say? Because one of the things that Eckhart says in the beginning of this book on page six is that this book's main purpose is not to add new information or beliefs to your mind or to try to convince you of anything, but to bring about a shift in consciousness, that is to say, to awaken. He says that on page six. And one of the reasons why I appreciate him so much is because he truly isn't out to become your next guru. He doesn't want, you know, all of you who are online with us tonight and those millions who will now hear about this book, He's not interested in being your guru, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs>
What, how would you end, respond to that? that? That's one of the biggest questions that we have um, coming into our message boards about um, the same thing that Kelly is, is, is addressing here from Alton, about spirituality and religion. This is not about trying to tell you how to believe. And how do you um, advise people to reconcile this with their religious beliefs? Well, religion can be an open doorway into spirituality, and religion can be a closed door mm -hmm. that prevents you from going, going deeper. Mm -hmm. if, so that, I love reading the New Testament, and some, I also read the Old Testament. Sometimes there's some incredible jewels mm -hmm. in there. And when I went through this inner transformation, and for the first time, accidentally, I picked up a copy of the New Testament at my mother's place, mm -hmm. and I started reading, and I immediately recognized the deep truth that is there, and I realized the truth that is deeper, that is expressed in what Jesus said, is much deeper than what you, how the church interprets it. There is a depth to it, and it reflects your own depth when you read it. So the, there's no conflict between between this teaching, which is purely spiritual, mm -hmm. and any religion, because if you go deep enough into your religion, then you all get to the same place. It's a question of going deeper. So there's no conflict here. With The important thing is that religion doesn't become an ideology. So it, it's, I believe this, and the moment you say, only my belief or our belief is true, and you deny other people's beliefs, then you you've adopted an ideology mm -hmm. and then religion becomes a closed door but potentially religion can also be an open door well let me share this with you too uh, uh kelly there is another book by a woman named elizabeth lesser it's called the seeker's guide where she talks about the new spirituality versus the old so i just wanted to yeah, this is on page 51 and 52 of, of uh, elizabeth lesser's book called the seeker's guide and she talks about old spirituality versus the new spirituality. And she says the old was, the old way, is the hierarchy has the authority. Church, church authorities tell you how to worship in church and how to behave outside of church. The new spirituality is that you are your own best authority. As you work to know and love yourself, you discover how to live a more spiritual life. The old is God and the path to worship him have already been defined and all you need to do is follow the directions. The new is being able to listen within for your own definition of spirituality. Your deeper longings are your compass on the search. And the old says exactly what Eckhart was saying, that there is only one path. It's the right way and all other ways are wrong. And the new spirituality says that many paths lead to spiritual freedom and peace. You have a rich array of gems from which to uh, draw illumination. The world's religious traditions, mythology, psychology, healing methods, scientific wisdom, your own exper experience, and that you can begin to string a necklace all your own. And then she lists, you know, other old and new. And so it's really a question of what you were saying to us earlier, that this material strikes a chord within you, something in you opens up, and once, you know, feels alive and is awakened to that, and yet, there is the, the ideology that says what to you? What is the conflict for you? Um, just the thoughts on the afterlife, things like that. You know, you, in a lot of books, such as Tolle's, we get teachings from Buddhism or Hinduism, and those thoughts don't go along with, you know, what I was raised to believe as a Christian. So that's been the biggest thing that I've struggled with, I think. So. Well, I am but. a Christian who believes that there are there are certainly many more paths to God other than Christianity. So, right. I'm a free-thinking Christian who believes that who believes in my way, but I don't believe that it's the only way with six billion people here on the planet. Right. Another author who uses that who might appeal to you who uses Christian terminology but goes very very deep using. Christian language and Christian teaching is Joel Goldsmith. Yes. Uh, so any book. Joel Goldstein. Goldsmith. Oh, Goldsmith. Joel Goldsmith. Any book by Joel Goldsmith, I think you will uh, try that and you can see how deep the Christian teaching can be. 
okay? Well, thank you very much. Well, thanks, Kelly. You're our first Skyper. Great. I didn't I'm even honored. know what Skype was until then. <laughs> Now we're Skyping all over. We have a Chicago study group watching our webcast together at Borders. Hello. Borders flagship Hello. store right there on Michigan Avenue. Hi, everybody. Hello. I know. Listen, we just, listen, I know it's our, my ego, but I just can't keep saying, stop saying how cool this is. <laughs> uh, I hear that's Ryan. You're Ryan? Yes, I'm Ryan. Okay, Ryan. Hello, Oprah. Hi. Got a question? Hello, Mr. Tully. Hi. I, I do. I have a question for actually either of you, um, and it relates to the spiritual awakening that, that you speak of in Chapter 1. Um, it seems to me that in, if you look at human history in the past 100 years, and, and very poignantly in the past 10 years, that there's there's been this intensity and speed at which people are um, becoming more aware of this Christ consciousness and why do you think that is the case now? Why is this happening now? It's happening now because we are reaching a crisis point. Uh, very very um, essential things don't happen until there's an absolute need for them to happen. So you can say, in the past, this awakening has been a luxury, and mm -hmm. only a few individuals here and there throughout the ages were able to be awakened. And they try to teach others, but to a large extent, their teachings became misinterpreted. So we are awakening now. Jesus was a revolutionary. Yes. Who got misinterpreted a lot. Yes. We are awakening now because we have to awaken if uh, humanity is to make it to a next evolutionary level. We need to awaken because the egoic consciousness will become so, it's already be, it has already become very destructive. It's become mm -hmm. more and more destructive. We will destroy ourselves and the planet if we do not step out of the egoic consciousness, the collective ego. Mm -hmm. If you look at the history of the 20th century, that gives you a taste of what it will be if there is no major shift. I wrote in The Power of Now that 100 million human beings were killed by other humans during the 20th century through warfare and so on. And I recently read in a history book by a Harvard professor that my figure was much too low. It's as much as 160 to 180 million human beings were murdered through warfare and concentration camps and prison camps and uh, starvation, purpose manufactured salvation because uh, mm -hmm. China, Russia, and so on. It's unbelievable insanity when you look at that history. And so if there's no shift in consciousness, we will go downhill very quickly because we're already in the process of destroying the planet, but there will also be continuous conflict, collective conflict, and eventually then humanity would collapse. So you think we're at a crisis point now? Crisis point, yes. Well, well, Ryan, don't you think so too? I mean, when you were with your friends, you know, obviously you're gathered here at Borders tonight because you are interested in this kind of, this way of thinking. But we all talk about it on, in some form or another, how bad things are, how, uh, you know, the media, everybody complains about the media and the movies. I mean, if you just look at the Academy Awards this year and the kinds of movies that were, were made this year, and, and it's all a reflection of who we are. And you say in, in the book how we're, we're the species that will go and watch other people on film be maimed and killed and murdered yes, yes. for our entertainment. Yes. Yes, it's amazing. That's, and it's noise. It's all. It, it's it's the mind. It's it's all of that. And I, my friends and I talk about it. And it's things where we we want to push that out and say, well, we choose not to look at those things. We choose not to surround ourselves with that type of energy. But I just got it. I just had an epiphany, an aha, as Eckhart was speaking here. I mean, and I'd read this several times in the book too. The number of people uh, murdered, maimed, uh, destroyed uh, by other human beings during the 20th century, but the aha for me was, yes, look at what we did in the 20th century, look at the surge that we've had in, uh, tech, in our technological abilities, look at you right now, we're Skyping each other, uh, the, the, the advancement in our abilities to create new bombs, new ways of killing each other, so that in the 21st century, if there isn't a shift, 
if you had a hundred over a hundred million people killed in the 20th century god only knows and i do mean god only knows yes. what will happen to us yes. unless we start to change this yes because technology amplifies the egoic dysfunction in human beings so before the dysfunction was the same 2000 years ago but we couldn't do that much harm because the technology wasn't there the very same dysfunction still operates and becomes magnified through science and technology does that answer your question ryan it does and i, I just it just makes me think of what could we do if we just focused that same energy on the positive and, and helping other people and, and and I feel that that's that's where we're going but it's also not just the positive one of the things that I think we all learn from reading a new earth that it's not just about being positive it's about putting our own egos in check because as we begin to move forward in our studies the next uh, 10 weeks you'll see that first you have to see you know see the voice in your head see how you're contributing to it because I think you know, for years we've all heard that we're all, if you're not a part of the problem, you're a part of the solution. I think most of us don't understand, um, and I did understand to an extent, but got it even more clearly after reading A New Earth, understand how we're contributing to the problem. Mm -hmm. And the way we're all contributing to the problem is, Eckhart? Well, you need to look at your own mind. So it's everybody's responsibility to become aware of their conditioned mental processes, how you react in everyday situations, what kind of thoughts go through your head. It's good to uh, not amplify the negativity that you see around you in the world by reacting to it. You have to be very much aware, of course, of what your mind is doing. So observe your own mind, be there as the witness of your mind so that the witnessing dimension which is awareness or presence mm -hmm. grows you are not your thought processes the thought processes are conditioned through thousands and thousands of years of conditioning and there is dysfunction built into the very structure of our thought processes and this is how the ego arises we'll right. talk about that in more detail that's right but to recognize in oneself there is you may not contribute to the murder and so on uh, out there in the world but every, it's everybody's responsibility to discover that dysfunction within them yeah so you get that right ryan what he's saying is is that um there is a collective consciousness that he talks about uh, pages 11 and 12 the dysfunction of the ego human mind has created the situation in the world today he says in the new earth and what i hear you saying eckhart is is that our individual uh fears, doubts, angers, jealousies, resentments, all contribute to the collective. Yes. And so in order to begin to change the collective, each one of us has a responsibility to sort of mine that within ourselves. Yes. Because that's how we're contributing to the collective. Yes. Yeah, and it's not just the road ragers. It's however you're you're holding resentment and anger and jealousy and fear in your own life. That's yes. what you're saying. Yes. What is what is it that you're putting out into the world? Is there negativity, mental, in emotional you. in you? Yes. Because that contributes to the collective energy field. So you can only go. So it's up to the individual to go to step out of the egoic consciousness. Yeah. You got that right, Ryan. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. Thank, well, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Borders. <laughs> thank you. We've got uh, Erica, who lives on a U.S. military base in Landstuhl, Germany. Oh, you're in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. Yes. Hi. Yes. Morning. 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 Yes. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Erica. Hi, Oprah. Thank you so much. This has just been crazy, as you said. <laughs> crazy fun. <laughs> Yes. Landstuhl, Germany. Never heard of it, but glad to have you from there. Hello. Oh, thank you. Glad. Thank God for Skype. <laughs> thank God for Skype. Okay. What, do you, what, do, what is your question or comment to us? Well, um, my, my question is for Mr. Tolley. Um, I, too, grew up in the Baptist Church, uh, just like Oprah and so many others. And you talk about the voice in my head. And I, I had a situation where I no longer attend that church because 
the behavior didn't line up with the teaching. But on Sundays when I'm at home with my family and we're enjoying a nice day and we decided not to go to church, that voice in my head says things like, you didn't go to church today. That's not how you were raised. When your mom calls, what are you going to say? Can you help me with that on explaining why we have the voice in the head that says things like that? Yes. <laughs> yes, he can help you, <laughs> Erica. <laughs> <laughs> now, the voice, of course, is the conditioned thinking. The voice, what the voice says, is conditioned by your past, by your childhood, by your upbringing, by the surrounding culture. All those things condition your thought processes. And when you, sometimes it happens when you awaken, maybe not completely, but when the awakening process begins, a lot of the old voices in the head, the old thoughts, still come up. They still come up. And the essential thing is to recognize them as conditioned thought processes. Mm -hmm. And to see, because the fact that you're asking the question means there's already an awareness there that these are the voices in your head, so you are not totally identified. Because if you were totally identified with the voice, you would say, I, I feel so terrible, I really think I should be doing this. But you realize it's the voice in the head that's mm -hmm. doing it. And then you can allow it and say, okay, there's an old thought, and allow it to be there and be the awareness behind the thought. And anybody, this is not just for in this part, your particular case, there are many other instances where people have the movement of thought, mm -hmm. telling them this or that, interpreting events and people according to the old conditioning when you meet people telling you immediately judging somebody according to your old conditioning with prejudices with all the old conditioning and to so it's you the only way you can gradually go beyond the conditioned thought processes is simply to be there as the witness you don't need to act on it or say go away i don't want to be thinking this that doesn't work it right. would only give it more energy that's right so, again, a, a vital thing, and this will be going throughout the book and the teaching, is uh, as much as possible, be aware of what your mind is saying and realize that's only a small part of the consciousness, the totality of consciousness that you are. Many people don't know that yet. They're totally one with the voice. They are the voice. They're so identified with every thought that comes there's no space between them and the thought. So the essential thing is there's realize there's thought processes, and here I am as the space for the thought, mm. as the awareness or the space for the thought. And that, that the thought is only a part of... A small part. It's the conditioned part of who you are. Who you are. A more, and the, that's time-bound. It's conditioned by the past. There's a more essential part of who you are, and that is the awareness that knows that there's a voice. The awareness of the thoughts. Yes. Which we're going to get into in further detail. But also, Erica, let me share yes. this with you. Part of uh, what you and our, our first caller uh, from Alton, Illinois, was uh, also talking about is... Is, is trying to reconcile the two. The reason why the voice keeps repeating is because, of course, of what Eckhart is saying, it's conditioned thinking. But also, the guilt is you haven't made a decision for yourself about what is real or true for you. So you're still being led by the conditioned thinking and haven't made a decision. And for me... Um, that came when I was able to do exactly what Eckhart said earlier. I didn't uh, phrase it the way he did. I asked God to use me. That has been my prayer for many years. I, you know, Eckhart says, ask life what is its purpose for you. But I would pray on my knees to God and ask to be used and to be a servant and to allow his spirit to work through me and to not to just be on television, but to be able to use television for a purpose that was greater than my own personality and to collect shoes in my closet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean I wanted to give up the shoes, but <laughs> I, would, I would if I had to. So when I yeah. started to ask that question of 
God, how can I be used? God, how do you want me to live? How would you have me be? Uh, I let go of the guilt of did I make it to church or I didn't make it to church because the, um, the, the majesty and power and omniscience of this force that we call God can't not be, cannot be contained in a church. You're right. Cannot be contained in a church and does not just want to be served in a church. But if church um, allows you to, to feel like you are being of service, then, uh, then use it that way. But the, the bigness is, is what, what, what Eckhart was saying in that quote in the book, man made God in his image, the eternal, the infinite and unnameable force that that is God, that is all consciousness, that is universal energy, I don't believe wishes to just be served on Sunday at 11 o'clock service. Mm -hmm. No, I don't And so that's what you're trying to reconcile with yourself, the voice in your head versus what you really should be doing. Mm. That's it. Yeah. So Thank you. That's you, it. You need to make that decision for yourself. And, and, Thank and, you. And start asking that question of God. Okay. All right? I will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, from Lundstuhl. <laughs> Lundstuhl, Germany. <laughs> we have Adam from Redmond, Washington, on the phone with a question. Yes, hello? Oh, on the phone phone. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Hi, hello. Adam. Hi. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I so feel a little like question. Larry King. Is the caller there? <laughs> <laughs> a little like Larry King. Um, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, gosh. Yeah, well, I used your online study group to, uh, to create a couple groups out here, which I called Embracing Silence. And um, for the purpose of joining together for <clears throat> meditation and study and discussion and to create a field of presence and share with others in that. And I'm curious, what role do you see community or joining with others with the intention of sharing this consciousness playing in the flowering of human consciousness? Good. Mm. Good question. Yes. It's very important. And, of course, what's happening here tonight is part of that also because it is a joining on a lev level that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, the arising presence... Uh, you can access it much more easily as part of a larger community or group of people. Uh, so to have a com uh, in your home, to have a group of people who practice being present, perhaps listen to a spiritual talk or have a little reading, mm -hmm. enter stillness, be present, is extremely helpful because a, an energy field is generated mm -hmm. when people come together and enter the state of presence together. So, and this is happening here also, although people are not physically together, mm -hmm. and yet there is an energy field now that is generated all over the planet of presence, a different level of consciousness being generated. So it's yeah. extremely helpful to join with others. Also, it needs to be said not to become dependent on any group. It is still your responsibility to bring this new consciousness into everyday life. Whenever you go about your business, in your family. Once you become dependent upon the group, then you've now... Then you always need to go back to the group and you cannot live presence in your daily life. Mm -hmm. So the important thing, yes, go to the group to generate more presence and then your responsibility is to live it in your everyday life where most of the time perhaps you will not yet be surrounded by people who are present you will be surrounded by the old egoic consciousness mm -hmm. so there this is and this is the challenge for everybody now who is awakening that yes uh, more and more people are beginning to awaken and yet there's still vast numbers of people on the planet who we're not. not. But I was going to say that when Ryan from uh, Borders was speaking to us and was saying, you know, the need to be more positive and there's all this negative energy in the world. Look, we have 700 and some thousand of us all gathered here this evening, uh, which is a huge positive force. Yes. In, in creating the shift. Yes. And it's a different kind of community. 
Yes. Like we've never seen or experienced before. That's right, mm -hmm. yes. And then, of course, the other, another kind of community is generated through the Internet now and all these things that I don't know much about, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. So how people communicate with each other. Uh, and again, there's a, people are being linked in different ways with each other. This is the arising of a new consciousness that he speaks about, Adam. Well, it's, it certainly is, and it's, you know, it's, it's very pleasurable to spend time with others and sharing this consciousness. You know, like you said, uh, when you were under the tree and you, you, felt the, uh, you felt that oneness and that majesty, well, imagine if you had someone sitting there next to you to share that experience with. I think it, it makes it even that much more sacred. I did have my two dogs, Luke and Layla, were there. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, what Adam. A secret moment. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Adam. That's uh, Adam from Redwood, Washington. Let's see some of the questions that you're sending us now. Uh, oh, this is cool. On uh, email. Okay, we're going to check the computer screen here. Tada. Questions are? Nothing's there. <laughs> Nothing's there. So I'll keep talking. Um, one of the things that really struck us so was um, so many people responded to this. Page 13, you don't become good by trying to be good. Mm -hmm. You don't become good by trying to be good. And carry on. Okay. There's more to that sentence. Yes, there is. I must go to page 13 to find <laughs> it. You don't become good by trying to be good. Um, but by finding the goodness that is already within you and allowing that goodness to emerge. But it can only emerge if something fundamental changes in your state of consciousness. Yes. So what that means, if, if nothing changes in your state of consciousness, the ego has many ideas. It says, I want to be a spiritual person. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be recognized as a spiritual person. I want to be more spiritual than all these people. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely more spiritual than you. Mm -hmm. So the ego has all kinds of ideas of what it wants to be. It might even say, yes, I want to be good because it wants to have a better image of itself. But on that level, but the, the essential dysfunction of the ego is still operating. So this is why we have the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because no matter how good your intentions are, when you're still trapped in the ego, it will always take you into conflict, eventually. So there are people... That's why I was saying to Ryan, you can't just think positively. No, such it's, thing. it's not enough. You have to go deeper. I mean, deeper. you can think positively, but it is not enough, because eventually something negative will come along to challenge the positive. Yes. Right. Yes. So you must... It's the realm of opposites. Yes. So you have to go deeper beyond the realm of opposites where there's good and bad and reach a place within yourself that is unconditioned, that is what I sometimes call the formless, formless, formless spirit. consciousness, what spirit, I spirit. Uh, expressed beautifully in the Old Testament in the little saying, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. That is, and that's in the Old Testament. It contains the entire wisdom of religion in those few words. Be still, meaning go to that place where the mind is no longer operating, where there's, you're just conscious without thinking. And that is the level where the eternal resides. Mm. So the eternal, the formless, the spirit, is the essence of every human being. Mm. No matter how insane or conflict-ridden they may seem to appear on the surface, within every human being, that remains untouched. There's nothing that anybody could have done to you or nothing that you could have done to others to destroy that. It's, it's always there. It's always there. And that is the grace of being here. Mm. And no matter how much madness there has been in your life, that remains untouched. So it's getting in touch with that deepest place within. And you can only do that by becoming still. Yes. Now, becoming still does not mean that you go to sleep. It means you're actually more alert 
than when you are thinking. It's this, you have to invite the stillness into your life as much as possible. That's why I loved your book, Stillness Speaks. Only that small, but yes. every page is a gem. Yes. Okay. And also, it's what I was saying earlier, that in order to feel that, the way you feel that, for everybody who's listening to us now, the way you begin to feel that is to look at nature. Yes. If you were to go out and just be with a tree, and I don't mean hug a tree. We're not talking about now you got to go hug a tree and eat granola. But if you were just to be with anything in nature, I like trees because they're so mm -hmm. majestic. They're so powerful and visual. And if you're with it for a time, you start to sense the presence of it, the stillness of it, and begin to recognize that stillness within yourself. Yes. So what you sense in the tree is also in you. And it's always in the tree. Yes. And when the wind is blowing and there's a storm. Yes. Yes. And that's a, that is also a sacredness that is there in the tree. Now our world doesn't know much. It's sacred. It has become an abstract concept. Nobody seems to know what sacredness is. But for, until you can feel it. Until you can feel it. When you feel, then you don't need a definition. People ask, please define what sacred is. You don't need a definition of what sacred is because sacred is the essence of who you are. Hmm. So it's sensing that. And you can sense it when you're still enough, you sense it in the tree. Now, isn't it interesting that you first came to recognize this when you were about to kill yourself? Yes. Yes. Sometimes you have to reach a limit. Humans have to reach a limit. The human species as a whole is reaching that limit. Mm -hmm. But also on a personal level, sometimes people have to be pushed to the limit. My ego was so obstinate and my pain body was so strong. I had to be pushed to the limit before the it cracked open. Well, j before we go any further, share that moment that you talk about in the beginning of Power of Now, when you were about to kill yourself. Yes. Feeling so much pain. Dreadful suffering at night. I would often wake up in extreme feeling of dread and fear, consumed by dread and fear. The whole world seemed alien. And I saw the thought one night, I woke up again, the thought came, I can't live with myself any longer. I just can't live with myself any longer. It's so painful. Uh, and, when I, and that thought repeated itself a few times and then suddenly something happened inside me and I looked at the thought. That was of course awareness. I didn't know that at the time what it was. I became aware of the thought and I said, I cannot live with myself. That's strange. So there must be I and there must be myself. Is, am I one or two? I seem to be two. <laughs> because if I can't live with myself, there must be two of me. Well, yes. and everybody has felt that, not to kill themselves, but everybody has felt or heard or you, you heard you say to yourself, I said to myself. Yes. I said to myself. Yes. And of course, the entire, what we call the voice in the head, we could also call it self-talk, mm -hmm. where you talk to yourself. And most people address themselves as you. So the voice says, you shouldn't have done that, or you should better... Or, uh, yes. So there's a constantly there's a there's a separation inside human beings, which is the essence of ego. Right. That there's a here's an image of who I think I am, and then there's a me, and okay. they, they get mixed up together. Okay. I'm sorry I interrupted you. <laughs> that thought though, but you you uh, getting ready to kill yourself said I can't live with myself any longer. Yes. Said that several times in your mind. And then I the sen I became aware of the structure of the sentence, and said if that's the case, then who is the self? that I cannot live with, and who am I? Wow. And at that moment, a separation happened completely between the, the essential I, which is the essential consciousness that I am beyond past and future, the, the stillness. eternal stillness, stillness, but awake stillness, mm -hmm. and all my thought processes, which were ego, would be, and they, it was all my thought processes that had created the dreadful suffering. Mm. The, the mind created entity, the unhappy me, was continuously fed by my thinking. It, it consisted of thinking, a, a stream of thinking. So did you, just, did you just decide that night, I guess I'll wait to see if no. I will kill myself? No. Yeah. The, the, I kind of, it was a kind of spiritual suicide. So the ego died. Instead of me having to jump off a bridge, fortunately, mm -hmm. the ego died. The ego dissolved. The ego as the unobserved mind dissolved. The ego. The false self, the me, the unhappy story. 
Oh, got it. Me as the unhappy, my identity as me and my unhappy story... Died. Died, dissolved, because the I behind it suddenly woke up and said, who is that self that I can't live with? And when you fully look at that self, it actually dissolves, because it cannot survive in the light of intense consciousness. Wow. And so the next morning I woke up and I didn't know, I thought, that was strange, what happened? Well, there was still, I felt myself... I thought, were you drinking? No drinking, <laughs> no drugs. <laughs> no drugs. <laughs> no acid. You had a couple sips or something. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Just, it just happened, and the... I felt like being drawn into a kind of vortex then, and then I went to sleep, and the last thing I felt, there was still some fear, a voice said, don't resist, or resist nothing. Resist, resist nothing. nothing, don't resist, resist nothing. And so I must have gone to sleep then. You had your first good night's sleep in God. Yes, went. and the next morning I woke up and looked around and looked, everything looked so fresh, all the old furniture, the, the pencil, everything looked fresh and alive and I could hear a bird song outside. Wow, as if I'd never heard it before. Wow. Because the, the mind had become still and there was simply the beautiful perception of everything, the yeah. sunlight coming through the curtains. Incredible, I said, well, I've never seen that before. The, and Sounds like a drug trip. Well, later on, people tell me, they ask me, is that like acid? Because yes. some people take acid and they say, oh, we experienced that when, when we took acid, they told me many yeah. times, until finally, I'll tell you in confidence, Finally, I tried acid just for once because You're I wanted... telling me in confidence yes. here? Okay, good. Well, Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it just once just to see... If it was it... the same thing? Yes. Yeah? Uh, it's not quite the same thing because what I experienced was much more subtle and beautiful. The, the acid I experienced as almost a violent thing where violently the perceptions, sense perceptions become so magnified that there was no room for thinking anymore. Uh -huh. But I could see why people say, why for some people it's a, it's a glimpse of what it means to perceive the world without this continuous interference of mental noise. Yeah. But, but I wouldn't trick without acid was, was better. Much better. Yeah. Oh, I was... Well, I, part of what you're describing is what I, I came close to that uh, when I uh, decided to go outside without naming things or labeling things is what I was describing earlier, walking through the park, walking around, you yeah. know, my house, which is like a park. Yeah. Uh, it, it, and everything was like vibrating, and it was the colors and everything. The sense perception was very different because I wasn't in my mind thinking about it. I was just there to experience yes. it. So, so that's how you get to, get to that place. That's right. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're then, you're no longer there when you walk through your garden mm -hmm. in that or wherever in and you're not naming every flower you're not naming and also you're not carrying the burden of a heavy me a personality a person with its problems with its mm -hmm. past with you're its not future. thinking no about so, anything so you are basically you become an, a conscious presence perceiving mm -hmm. the beauty around you yeah it's fascinating well okay we we do have an email now from uh kathy in Delta, Colorado. Is that where you are? Well, no, she can't talk. It's an email. Uh, how do I sh shed the years or rather decades of conditioning and distractions, sickness, relationships, work, in order to hear and feel the moments of stillness? Which is what we're just talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. The good thing is you don't need years and years to undo years and years of conditioning. Because do it in an instant. Yes, only now. Only now. So it's the access point is the present moment. It's the present moment is the point of power to enter the new state of consciousness. So we need to learn how to, how to find in our daily life, as often as possible, this point of power of the present moment. Because if we don't, we get continuously dragged along by the old conditioning of the mind, the, all the old thought processes, all the old reactions, and so on. So there are, I've, there are many little things you can do to access the power of the present moment. For example, a very simple thing, ask, ask yourself, am I still breathing? Now, what does that mean? 
how to find out if you are still breathing, your attention needs to move from the thinking into here. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly feel the air flowing into your body and out of your body. Hmm. Yes, I'm breathing. At that moment, you've entered a state of presence. Even if it's only five seconds, mm -hmm. you've entered that, you've become present. In the moment. In that moment. Mm -hmm. So another thing I suggest is when you do think habitual uh, everyday motions like washing your hands or walking across the room or walking down the stairs or the slightest thing, taking a cup out of the cupboard, do it consciously, do it being present of every, how you, it, the feel, of, for example, you wash your hands, feel the water, mm -hmm. the, smell the soap. We have this in one of the workbook Except, exercises online, yes. yes. Sense perceptions, becoming acutely conscious of sense perceptions, which means looking, hearing, touching, if also, brings you into the present moment. How is that going to help me? Because I started doing that, going up the stairs. I was going, one foot on the stairs, there's another foot on the stairs, there's another foot, okay, I'm at the top of the stairs now. I was present walking up the stairs. How, wh what does that do for me, Eckhart? Were you present? Yeah, I think I was. There's a foot, there's a foot, there's a foot, there's a foot on the stairs. I'm just there. What, what, okay. The movement of, what, you no, know, the, feeling, the, uh, feeling the motion of my body and yes. how many parts of my body have to move to get me up the stairs. Yes. And, you know, oh, I used my, uh, you know, thigh muscle there. Yeah. Yes. I used the back of the leg. Oh, Good. My ankles okay. Move. Yeah, that yeah. was presence. I okay. wasn't sure from the way you said it. I thought you were repeating mentally, here's one step and here's another step, but you were not. No, you I was not. No. I was feeling every part of what yes. it took to get me up the stairs. Yes. Yes. So now the, the mind says, what, what's the point in that? Yes, the mind then said, <laughs> okay, now you were present getting up the stairs. And the now mind what? says, I've got more important things to think about. Then. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> mind said, now what did that do you? <laughs> Now, to the mind, that kind of thing is completely meaningless because you are inviting a different state of consciousness into your life, which the mind cannot understand. But this is, this is how you bring in awareness. This is the end of the old conditioning. Yes. And you bring in a consciousness that is totally fresh and new that comes out of the present moment. And the more you bring those moments of presence into your life, the more your old conditioning becomes eroded gradually. I see. So learning to do it with washing your hands. I just Simple got this. things. Well, this is good. This class is good for me. I don't know about <laughs> the rest of y'all, but I got it now. But just learning to do uh, the simple things begins to retrain your mind. Yes. And another thing is most simple things that you do, which actually fill up most person's uh, everyday life, because yes. the whole day consists of simple things that you have to do. Right. They're all relatively simple. Right. And the way most people live is that everything you do is a means to an end. And the end is where you want to get to, the next moment. Right. So, so you're never thinking about the moment. No, yes. because you want to get to the next one. You're washing your hand in order to already do that. Or yes. you're making, a, while you're making a cup of coffee, we really want to be drinking it. Yeah. John Kabat-Zinn says in his book, Coming to Our Senses, that most people every morning, people take a shower or they bathe or something. But most people are in the shower, but they never actually get to experience, no. experience the shower because no. they're thinking they're already in the office. Yes. They're already in the office. And then everything you do is a means to an end. The end is always the next moment in the future, which never arrives because all you ever have in life is the present moment. Present moment. So you're constantly frustrated, yes. creating anxiety for stress. yourself and stress yes. because you can't just be present, present now. Right now. And the power can only flow into your life when you are present completely, totally with what you're doing now. And this is why most people's lives has, do not have this power because they are always living for the next thing, so they... Trying to get to. They devalue the present moment. Got right? it. And so... That's why walking up the stairs, being with the stairs... Yes. ...teaches you how to be present with other things. Yes. And, yes. and then gradually you can be present with... Even when you are with other human beings, you can be totally present in whatever work you do, so that the work is not a means to an end, mm -hmm. but you are totally there with what you do, mm -hmm. your attention. Well, I, I see Cinda from uh, Oregon is, has been waiting to, to talk to us. Cinda? Yes. 
Hi, from Oregon. What's your question? Hello, Oprah. Hello, Eckhart. Hello. Hi. 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 Hey, I am so grateful for this opportunity to have Eckhart answer my question. Thank you for having me participate in this. And Eckhart, I need you to know that I am grateful that when you tried acid, that you preferred enlightenment more than that, because my children are upstairs listening in on this. <laughs> Because he was going to um, say, and I interrupted him, you were saying, I don't recommend it. No, Wait. I don't. Why? Uh, because it's, you will always fall back. It, it's, it's not, it, you always fall back to the old state of consciousness, and it's almost, I experienced as almost a violent thing being done to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say that for the children upstairs, Cinda. Yeah, thank you, Obra. <laughs> okay, your question. Well, my question is this, and, you know, first of all, I also want to tell Eckhart that his words in his book have moved me to my core, and I am a new person because of it, and not only because of my internal changes, but the way that I am in the world that I live. And I am so grateful for that. Thank you, Eckhart. Um, I want to ask a question. It's something that we've already talked about a little bit tonight, but I feel it's important enough to bring up again and I believe that the way that Eckhart answers this question might just be the catalyst to change that we need in order to save our planet and ourselves. Um, on pages 20 and 21 in the book, you talk about in an ever-changing world or an ever-changing environment, a species needs to either adapt or they will die out. And then you go on to say, and I quote, that humanity is now faced with a stark choice, mm -hmm. evolve or die. Mm -hmm. My question to you is this. Mm. When you say evolve or die, do you mean that literally, and it sounds like you might, or do you mean that metaphorically, which I hope? Evolve or die refers to humanity as a whole whether humanity survives as a species. Even if, even if humanity did not survive as a species, no gain in consciousness is ever lost within the totality of consciousness. So the fact that we are here and consciousness, which is really all that exists, we are only forms that ca come out of consciousness, and consciousness is the evolutionary process of the universe and we are here together as part of this evolution of consciousness which comes through the human form mm -hmm. consciousness can use and does use millions, millions and of billions forms. of other forms yes. and evolves through that yes out of the unmanifested in the unmanifested consciousness is already perfect or god you could say timeless perfect eternal no change and then you have this so-called manifested dimension, which some uh, ancient teachers have described as a kind of dream, which is what it is. But for some reason, consciousness wants to come into this world of form. And in this world of form, it evolves. Mm -hmm. So one could say that gradually, more and more, God, which is another word for consciousness, God comes into this world of form gradually emerges and God comes through you, God comes through me, God comes through you, gradually more and more. The density of form lessens mm -hmm. and this is what's happening. And so even if humanity didn't make it, consciousness would, the gain in consciousness that has already been achieved by those human beings who have become conscious would make consciousness express itself much more easily through some other form because ultimately we are not the form we are not the body that we see humanity you are not the form that is sitting there in essence you are beyond you are the formless consciousness itself with the stillness temporarily assuming this particular form mm -hmm. and of course the form eventually is going to dissolve anyway because then consciousness moves on mm -hmm. consciousness is continuous evolution continuous metamorphosis mm -hmm. it's a wonderful process so there's nothing to be scared of because ultimately when i say evolve or die i'm only speaking of you the humanity as a species but ultimately nothing dies 
is only a transformation of consciousness, a transformation of form. A transformation of, of form. form. Yeah. So there is no death, but, ultimately. But, but you do mean the end of our human species as we know it. Yes, that is a possibility, yeah. Yeah. but the fact that we are here tonight uh, would, should give us hope and confidence that humanity is going to make it because this is growing and not just this teaching there are other spiritual alive spiritual teachings mm -hmm. there is a an enormous awakening happening on the planet so i have nobody knows i don't know the answer whether humanity is going to make it but i do feel confident now more so perhaps than before yes that we are going to make it well, yes, because that's one of my favorite quotes too, Cinda, that we are a significant portion of the Earth's population will soon recognize, if they haven't already done so, that humanity is now faced with a stark choice, evolve or die. Thank you for raising that question in such a beautiful way, Cinda. Thank you, Oprah. Thank you, Eckhart. Thank Thanks you. for joining us. Thank Casey uh, in Asheville, North Carolina is on Skype and has a question also for Eckhart about the secret. Casey? Hi, Oprah. Hi, Mr. Tully. Oh. Um, I was debating about whether to read this book because um, it looked very deep to me, <laughs> to be honest. And I have a one-year-old, and I hang out with her all day, and I didn't know if I was ready for it. But Oprah, when I saw your show on The Secret and The Bubble Man and all that good stuff, I thought, I have got to read that book because you talked about a new earth so much in that show. So my question is this. When I put out into the universe, when I ask God, um, for things, for hopes and dreams and material things, and um, and a lot of times I get them. Those material things, they, I think they may be coming from the ego, and I just wonder, um, Mr. Tully, is that wrong? Okay, well, it's not wrong. Uh, you can always easily recognize that something is coming from ego because when you get it, it doesn't satisfy you. That's always a sign that it's coming from ego. It may satisfy you for a little while, and then it sounds, oh, I need more, I need something else. So that's a good learning process. You can manifest things, and if you see, oh, that's not satisfying, it must have been the ego. So there's nothing wrong with manifesting things. The only illusion would be to expect things to provide some ultimate satisfaction in your life. Things can't do that. The world of form can't ultimately satisfy you. You can enjoy the world of form, but the true satisfaction doesn't come from there. The world can't do that. The world can't make you happy. Mm -hmm. Things cannot give you happiness. Right. Because happiness comes from a deeper place within you that you can only access in the present moment. So it's fine to, we live in the world of things, why not manifest things is part of the game of, in this life, the mm -hmm. game of form. But if you expect some kind of satisfaction, then you will always be frustrated. Which is going to be, yeah, I think we get into that a lot in chapter three. Yes. And chapter two and chapter three. Oh, not okay. allowing yourself, oh, love chapter two. Chapter oh, three. so good. Not allowing yourself to be defined by the things, to be in the world and not of it is how I describe it. To not allow, to have things, you know, I have lots of beautiful things and I love beautiful things. Uh, and later on in one of the chapters he talks about when you say um, that you're not defined by things, what happens to you uh, if you were to lose any of those things? Okay. The, the, the depth of your, you know, grief, grieving or sorrow or, you know, so-called suffering, um, determines how attached you were to those things. Yes, and for many... say it doesn't matter to me until somebody steals that's your right. car. That's yes. right. Yeah. And for many people, that's a very important lesson when suddenly they do lose something. It can be a, a wonderful spiritual lesson, and then you perhaps you suffer, and then your attachment gets broken, and suddenly you go beyond the attachment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there have been people who have lost everything, and suddenly become free of the ego because the ego had nothing left to identify with. So this can happen. And another uh, important thing to mention with regard to manifestation is the basis for your life is the present moment. You need to, first of all, the very basis for everything is to come to an acceptance of this moment as it is. 
gratitude is part of that. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'll be talking about that in more detail. So that there's no neediness when you manifest. This, the neediness that uh, you, there's dissatisfaction, for example, in your life. If there's dissatisfaction, that is not a good place, not a good starting point for changing your life. The ego may tell you that, but it isn't. You need to find, to find a place of acceptance, mm -hmm. not, which is... Wow, that's powerful. No matter where you are, mm -hmm. come to terms and come, become friendly with the present moment. Because if you do not become friendly with the present moment, you're not friendly with life. If you're not, because life is only now. If you're not friendly with life, life cannot support you. But did you just say that uh, being in a place of dissatis being dissatisfied is not a good time or place to change? It's first, you can see the totality of, situ of the situation, let's say, I, I use the example in the power of now, you're stuck in the mud. You're yes. walking somewhere and suddenly you get deep into the mud up to your knees. Right. Now, you wouldn't say, okay, I'm satisfied with this situation. You can't right. be satisfied with this, right. this situation. And you know that you need to get out. But you say, okay, here I am stuck in the mud and I need to get out. There is no Cursing the negative mud. reaction. Yeah, there's no Cursing. Damn this mud! Yes. Yeah. Or struggle against. Yeah. Because if you struggle against, you get in deeper. You're just going to get more mud on you. Yes. Yeah. So, to you, very important, perhaps the, the key, one of the key things here in this or any spiritual teaching is uh, the question that you need to ask yourself as much as possible. You can even put it on your bathroom mirror or some other places where you uh, often look. And that question is, what is my relationship with the present moment? Mm. And to become very conscious of that, and, to, and then you find out, then you, of course, need to become alert. Okay, what's my relationship with this moment? Am I, is there negativity, in which case I'm, I'm fighting, I'm making the present moment into an enemy? Yeah, and what you say is, what you resist persists. Yes. So you must make peace with the moment. Yes. Doesn't mean you have to be approve the situation. No. But you must make peace with the moment in order to get yourself out of it. Yes. Because resisting is only going to cause more of it. Yes. Okay. And that's absolutely vital. That so peace with what is the isness of this moment is already as it always already is as it is. The ego doesn't understand that, but you can't really argue with yeah, what is because right. it already so is. So you must accept whatever it is first before you can begin to change it. That's what you're saying. Yes. That's the there must be acceptance. Acceptance of first. what is first. First. Then action comes out of the acceptance. It no longer comes out of resistance. Got it. Which is a totally different energy flows into what you do when it comes out of an acceptance of this is what is, and then action happens that is actually empowered by life itself. Well, I think that explained it, Casey. Thank you. I think so, too. Thank you so Thank much. You so That's much. amazing. Thank you so Thank much. You. I just wanted to go back to uh, spirituality and religion for a few moments and the few moments we have remaining because I know that's still such a major issue with so many of you. And you say on page 17 that the more you make your thoughts or beliefs into your identity, the more cut off you are from the spiritual dimension within yourself. Yes. And you also say on page 18 how spiritual you are has nothing to do with what you believe. Yes. But everything to do with your state of consciousness. Yes. How spiritual you are means how present, how present are you mm -hmm. at this moment? Are you in your thoughts or are you there as the awareness behind your thoughts? Which is your spirit. Yes. Yeah. Stillness. So the, uh, often in, in newspapers and the media, they, when you, they always ask, well, what do you believe in? It, that is not an important question, what I believe in. It's the important question is, are you present at this moment? Not, not what your belief structures are. I think people want to know what you believe so that they can label it and decide whether yes. they're going to like you, accept you or not. Yes. yes. And they want to know, do you believe the same thing that I believe? Because if you don't, you're my enemy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you're laughing at that. Okay. <laughs> well, it's mad. It's better to laugh at madness. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to mention this person, Maria from Doha, Qatar. I just wanted to say Doha, Qatar. In? Uh, yes. In what country? Qatar. 
Qatar. Okay. No, Qatar. Okay. Qatar. Okay. She says, do you think that people are ready and willing to set aside time to be quiet each day? Is this possible in a global sense? Would anyone who thinks their life is fine be willing to, to waste time just sitting in order to raise their consciousness level? Well, uh, better, I would uh, change the question a little bit to make it more vital and more relevant, is ask, am I ready? The only question you really need to answer is, am I ready Love that. to do this? Mm -hmm. You don't need to know whether other people are ready to do it. Only you can have the answer, am I ready to be still? Very good, Miss Qatar. <laughs> <laughs> am I ready? Let's see, that's the vital question, and only you can answer that. I can't answer that. Are you ready, or are you so fascinated by the things of this world and your mind that perhaps you need to pursue those things for a few more years until you suffer a bit more and then you're ready. Well, yes. When we were doing rehearsal for this yesterday, we were up on Skype and someone said, uh, I'm 28 years old and uh, I, don't, I don't think I need to be awakened. So what can I get from this book? I go, don't waste your time. Go read another book. Yes. Yeah. Have you it. don't think you need to be awakened then? No. That's right. So it's, the time is not yet there for everybody, and that's fine, too. What about the people who are struggling, particularly in this first chapter with the book? The first chapter is a little bit more conceptual than the other chapters and less practical. I wanted to give a, a general context for where the book fits into the general context of the spirituality on the planet, the transformation of consciousness on the planet. So just just read through. There are already very important pointers in the first chapter, if you can see them, that, that will run through the whole book, presence and mm -hmm. so on. Just carry on, uh, but not only the first chapter, anywhere in the book, don't expect to immediately understand everything mm -hmm. that's not necessary. And besides, understanding the book is not the essential thing, it's secondary. The, the first thing is to experience the truth of it rather than conceptual understanding, the essence of what's in the book, but in any case, cannot be understood conceptually. For example, presence. People say, can you explain to me what presence is? I've already given a few pointers. It would, it's pointless to go beyond that and give further definitions. You can only know what presence is by being present. You must have at least a glimpse of presence, which, and this is why the, it's not understanding that's the essence. So when you don't understand, just read on. Mm -hmm. It's a process. Reading this book is a process. Yes. And this book, as you say, uh, again, as I said in the beginning, this isn't about creating a, more information for you to believe in. No. Yeah. No. And you don't want to be anybody's guru. No. Mm -mm. No. So it's only... It's not through your mind, really, that you can get... And, and anybody who finds this book meaningful and this is the important thing, is already awakening. Mm. If you're not awakening already, this book will be completely meaningless, or any other truly alive spiritual book will be meaningless. If you won't understand it, or you say, there's not much there, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. If it does make sense, and especially if you feel something from within responding, and you say, wow, yeah. Well, I think also, too, for a... a for all of you who've joined us, there are a lot of people who um, are expressing they're getting it, they're awakening, they're feeling more alive and excited, and then you want to go share it with somebody else who perhaps hasn't read the book, doesn't feel the same as you, and then they feel frustrated. Yes. And I guess you would say the same thing as you say to the woman for, to, in Qatar, just worry about yourself. Yes. And so if other... Concern yourself with yourself. That's right. And if friends or relatives say doesn't make sense to me, that's fine. That's, perhaps in a few years' time they'll be ready. Mm -hmm. We don't know. So it's to accept that it's not yet for everybody. Accept it first. Accept. 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 Don't demand that, or don't make it into an ideology and then try to convince people that they must be present. Right. <laughs> I got it. Before we say goodbye, I want to thank you for being with me, all of you out there. This is just the most exciting thing I have ever done. Uh, being able to talk with you all and share this kind of information that allows all of us to get closer to who we really are so that we can do uh, honor our life's purpose and calling here uh, while we're on Earth. And we'll be here next Monday again at 8 p.m. Central. If you want to experience this first class again or tell a friend who missed it, our webcast will be available on demand tomorrow 
for free here at Oprah.com. You'll also be able to update your workbook uh, and get started on chapter two. And if you want to download the podcast of this class, you can do that too at Oprah.com and at iTunes. Next week, woo! Moving out of con the conceptual chapter one into the good stuff. Yes. Moving on, the next week we'll be talking about the ego. <laughs> wow. We'll see you next Monday night. Thank, thank you, Eckhart. You. Thank you. And thank you so much to all of you around the world. Good night. Good morning. Hello.